the least enjoyable thing in the world is having dirty glasses. I don't think that's true. <laughs> <laughs> Lights, camera, and action. Oh my goodness, it's recording. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the workshop. Fantastic to... <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, it's fantastic to have you here because we're welcoming you back to the workshop. <laughs> what we're the doing? Is welcome. going on? <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the workshop. And you know, hopefully we'll be giving you some A's that are useful. What a, I mean... Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the workshop for a different edition of your regularly scheduled content. Today we're going to be doing some Q&As. So a while ago, Alec posted on his story a question thing and didn't answer any of the questions so that we could do them today for a video. That's right. We got some questions from you all. We're going to be trying our best to answer them. Before we jump in though, we should thank today's sponsor. Today's sponsor, folks, is Skillshare. It's the online learning community with over 25,000 online video courses and everything imaginable. Whether you want to learn more about running a small business, whether you want to learn more about illustration or photography or filmmaking, you can learn it with Skillshare, especially right now because they're going to be giving you two months of Skillshare Premium for you to try and enjoy for free when you go to my link in the description down below. Check them out. Let's jump back into the video. It's question time. Taylor asks, as someone who has watched most of your videos, what would be the best way to get into the art of forging and what would be the bare minimum you would need? So I think we both really started with the bare minimum, uh, both starting at our parents' houses when we were, I was 13 when I started knife making and 16 when I started forging. Uh, and I started off with a one by 30 belt sander and like a hundred square feet of garage space. Yeah. So you really don't need a whole lot at all. It's, it, and there's a, there's a difficult one too, because I always like to stress with this question. The best way to get into it, like easiest way, ultimately probably the least expensive way also in the grand scheme of things, is to just go and take a one day blacksmithing class. Absolutely. That's gonna dip your toes in the craft way further than you can by spending a similar amount of money on equipment. And so like I always wanna preface everything with take a class. Yep. There's people doing blacksmithing classes everywhere and, and, and you can get in, get in one and, and see if it's of interest to you. But from there, absolutely. I started out with some bricks and a foot pump for a, inflating a boat, pushing air into a charcoal fire. Yep. You can start out with just a lump of metal and you can spend very little money to start these things. Will has done a video series on making stuff with incredibly limited tools. So it's very accessible, but the fastest way to give it a shot is to take a class. And so yep. I'll always recommend that off the bat from there. You uh, put some bricks together in the ground, pump some air into a charcoal forge, find a lump of metal, start hammering and have at it. Mm -hmm. Nick asks, have either of you thought about trying to be on Forged and Fire? We have. I think we've both thought about it. I was actually scheduled for an episode at one point. Uh-huh. But it was right when I was moving from Seattle to Montana, and so I was in between shops at the time that they were going to be filming it, and also it was, I had a, a wedding that I needed to be at at that point as well, and so uh, since then, it's just been. You went a little further down the process than I did. Did you yep. sign contracts at all? I never signed contracts. They sent the paperwork over for me. So we got just about the same point. I was gonna, while I was still in the UK, mm -hmm. I was gonna be on their first international version. And then I kind of thought, you know what, this is just, I, I don't know if I really want to do this. Big time commitment. And at the time I was really pushing hard on YouTube and it was going to be a big time commitment, a big interruption in kind of the goals I had at the moment. So I just kind of decided to not do it mm -hmm. and instead use my time to build the YouTube channel. And frankly, at that point in time, I'm glad I did. We ended up getting this, which is, which is very exciting. Mm -hmm. So I haven't done Forge and Fire. Neither of us have done it. We've considered it. Will we ever do it? I don't think, I don't feel that for it. That's not really my kettle of tea. Of tea? Your kettle of coffee. You don't have this is America now. No, 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 you have kettles of water <laughs> and pots of tea. Ollie K asks, how tall actually are you and Will? Four foot three. <laughs> so we do, we do make a lot of jokes about us both being really short. It's because we're both very average height. We're both about 5'8". Unfortunately, I think we're below average height. Ooh, we're both above average height because the average male height is 5'6". Come on. That's internationally though. Come on. Do you remember being in school? I remember being in school and everybody was always, you know, at least a foot and a half taller than me. Yeah, I know me too. So we're both excessively average height at five foot eight inches. Uh, I don't know what that is in meters, like one. 
Me to 73. Adam F. was wondering how the garment endeavor was going and will knowledge from that ever be put into a piece of armor in the future? Oh, good. That's a double pronged question from Adam. Um, how's the garment endeavor going? It is going well. It is a slow process and it's all behind the scenes because we did a little bit of the sewing videos and I found out that not too many people were interested in seeing me sew things. So we changed tack in terms of the content that we produce from it. But garments are happening and we have some pants going into production which is gonna be incredibly exciting. I'm actually wearing one of the prototypes right now. Sneak peek. Not that you can see them in YouTube videos for a long time. <laughs> I'm wearing some of the prototypes, making sure that they're all dialed. So the Garmin Endeavor is a slow and steady process. Manufacturing clothes takes a long time. Will we ever make armor though? I, we've had a lot of requests for it. A lot, a lot. I myself am not really interested in making armor. Right, we also don't know how to do it. Yeah. How, knowing how to do it, though, isn't necessarily a problem. We tend to try projects that we don't know how to do. I just made a bike. Yep. So, the, I guess once the interest lines up with the right type of project where we see, oh, you know what, actually this is within our capability, we might try it then. Yep. It's also a very different set of tools for working sheet metal than for working uh, real pieces of metal. <laughs> <laughs> Samuel E. asks, any chance for Daily Steel to make a comeback? Oh, the good old days. So when I started, just for those of you that aren't aware, when I started hitting YouTube hard back in 2016, I was making videos every single day, and I did 100 days straight, which was just so painful and very, very tiring to do. And then I kind of slowly tailed off and tailed off down to like six days a week, then five days a week of YouTube videos, and then... I got a girlfriend, proceeded to get married. Life became a whole lot more balanced between personal time and business time. And so, are we ever gonna be able to make daily videos again? It's really difficult. Anytime you see a YouTuber making videos every day, they are working incredibly hard and they're sacrificing a lot to be able to do it. And I don't think I'm able to make those sacrifices anymore to be able to make that volume of content. Even with both of us working full time on making videos, it's really hard to do daily videos. I incredibly. And, and now we've kind of found that it's more and more difficult to make as many videos with the input of time. Kind of based on the fact that as we make videos, we are going into the territory of making projects that we don't know how to make, one, so it takes more time, but two, we've already covered a lot of the things in the process of making anything, and so what are the interesting points to talk about? When we make a sword, it used to be that it was interesting the whole way through, but there's a bunch of projects of making swords. We have to find these other interesting elements to talk about in the video, and so it just becomes invariably more and more difficult to make videos from the same amount of time. SV asks, which Alex Steel Co. team member would survive the longest in the wilderness? I, you know, I've just got to say, like, growing up as a kid, I watched so many action movies. I watched so much Bear Grylls. Mm -hmm. So much. I feel pretty, feel pretty good about it. Yeah. But then again, you feel pretty good about it. Growing up as a kid, living in the wilderness and being an Eagle Scout and stuff like that makes me feel pretty good about it too. You know, I think we need a competition. I think this is the steel versus shelter we need. We need to put Will and I out in the wilderness to fight it off against the bears. Drew asks, are we ever going to meet Mrs. Steele? I met Mrs. Steele. You did? Yeah. Oh, interesting. It's probably interesting. when I performed your wedding ceremony. <laughs> I think that probably would have done it. In terms of the internet meeting Mrs. Steele, there's a few factors to consider. On the business side of my life, I have a very public existence where you see all, you know, you see the things we do in the workshops. But on the private side, I'm actually a pretty kind of private and, I guess, Reclusive, there we go. <laughs> I'm like kind of a reclusive individual, and my wife is as well. We kind of like having our private life be a little bit private. So me having this public facing life in business is one thing, but to then drag my wife into the public eye isn't particularly fair. And so it's just based about when she's comfortable for it, because it's an unsettling thing to be brought into the public eye. And that's no fun. And so there's respect for her privacy and the privacy of our relationship. We don't put a whole load of uh, stuff out on social media about our relationship. Maybe one day we will. It's not me in a wig, by the way, for those of you who- Or his theory. sister. Or my sister. Not my sister. No. Nope. I do have a sister. It's not her. Evan A asks, do you have to put on a persona for the camera or do you act the same regardless? I would say Alec is a little bit more reserved generally and I'm a little bit more outgoing than I am on camera. 
think that's okay. I think that's a very astute observation. I think it comes out to the point where we're like pretty pretty similar energy levels, or Alec is a little bit more energetic on camera than I am, but off camera, I'm a lot more energetic and Alec is a lot more reserved. So that's, uh, that's yeah, it's flip-flop from what you might think. I think that sums it up pretty well. <laughs> Evan also asks, do you guys experience any challenges due to your young age? Uh, yes, I would say yes. I'd say it's really easy to not be taken seriously uh, because we both look like we're 12. Um, and so that, that can definitely be a big challenge. I think it's, 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 there's less of it now though. Yeah. You're a little younger than me, just a little bit. And, and I remember it being an issue a whole lot more when I was younger. When I left school, then it was an issue because I was actually 16 and so legitimately did look like a 12 year old. I remember even just when I was starting my business, I was incredibly nervous to even call a painting company for them to paint some railings that I made. I was so nervous about it and so like you'd be going into situ- and so I'd be going into situations already feeling nervous and self-conscious about the fact that I was just a kid and so you know you can kind of project your own nerves onto a situation and then when you're nervous about being young and not knowing what you're doing it's then very easy for people to see that you're young and you don't know what you're doing. Yeah. But the more it goes on, it doesn't really matter so much. Yeah. I think that now at this point, you know, I'm 22, we'll just turn 21. Happy Thank birthday. You. Thank you. I don't think that there's anything really happening that much that's happening from age issues. Yeah. I would say I used it quite a bit to my advantage, especially when I was just trying to learn a whole lot from different people because a lot of the makers are very excited about a young person getting into mm -hmm. it. And so one of my, what I would say, one of my best talents would be uh, inviting myself over to people's shops to this learn guy's from a social them. butterfly. It's <laughs> ridiculous. Yeah, so that was something that I, that I learned pretty early on was um, how to invite myself over well and not be hopefully too intrusive. Uh, hopefully have something to offer, whether it's offering the hand sand blades or whatever, just to pick up knowledge. Um, and because I'm young, because I was younger, they seemed very open to that idea and very, very, very giving with knowledge. And I know you experienced the same oh, absolutely, thing. Absolutely. Um, Austin S asks, "What's it like to own your own business, and how are you handling the pressure?" Good question. Uh, difficult. Not great. <laughs> Liz asks, "How did Will get into blacksmithing?" So, I started off as a knife maker, and a knife maker. That, that term is just anyone who makes knives. Fascinating. 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 Cultural development. Fascinating. Fascinating. And inside of knife making, there are people who do stock removal and people who do forging. And the people who do forging are bladesmiths. And so I went from knife making into forging knives, so bladesmithing, and then from bladesmithing, I started doing a little bit of blacksmithing. I never did a whole lot of blacksmithing. I mainly stuck to doing knives because that's what I love, but I got into blacksmithing through knife making and doing that little progression right there. So knife making, you started when you're 13. Mm -hmm. You then started forging knives as a bladesmith. Went pretty seriously when I was, I had a little forge before that, but I got my first actual forge and really started forging knives when I was 16. Great, and then so then it was a couple years after that that you then kind of tried forging other things. Exactly. Because so, making making a pair of tongs, for example, is in the remit of blacksmithing. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's when you start forging things other than knives that you start blacksmithing. Exactly. That would have been a few years later than that. But I started bladesmithing, and then I started hanging out with blacksmiths a little later on and learning how to forge some other stuff. I'm still not very good at that. Mainly stick to the knives and Damascus and stuff like that, but. Knife making, bladesmithing, blacksmithing. Matt wants to know, will there be any possibility to visit the workshop in the future? I'd say probably not. We get a lot of people wanting to visit the workshop and then there's just a little bit of a supply and demand kind of issue. Um, and then there's also like the stranger danger kind of issue, you know. Being 12, we have to be wary of strangers. Exactly, my mother is very clear. Stranger danger at all times um, and so probably not gonna have any visit to the workshop. Something that I have been toying with in my head which I'm now just gonna bring up in front of the whole world, is maybe not at the workshop, but like at a local fairground or something, doing an event, you know, once the Verona has died down um, and things are a little safer in the world, you know, there might be a little bit of an excitement about the idea of getting together these lovely viewers, maybe some other demonstrators and bladesmiths teaching things, opportunity maybe for people to make things too. Some big ideas to just throw out there, just whoop, right out of the head. But that would be a cool way for people to come and meet us and hang out. And when I was just a wee little lad. Last year. 
<laughs> when I was a wee little la a lad, I made so many great connections and friendships through blacksmithing hammerins and forgins, as they're called in the UK. Learned so much. It was always such a great opportunity. So it'd be lovely to host something like that. Yeah, they're called forge ins. <laughs> Come on, Will. <laughs> That'd be fun. Maybe we'll do that in 2021. Eric wants to know how you two met. Uh, we met at a train station in Norwich. Just by happenstance. It definitely wasn't orchestrated. Through mutual friends in the blacksmithing community. In the orchestra. <laughs> we met through mutual friends in the blacksmithing community. <clears throat> the guy that made this hammer, Jacob Farm, incredibly talented blacksmith. Mm -hmm. We met through him because uh, we're both friends with him and I saw his stuff and I'm like, wow. Firstly, it's just so exciting to see other fellow young people in this craft. Mm -hmm. And so I'm always excited to reach out. And I was like, wow, look at the amazing work you do, Will. If you're ever in Europe, I'd love to get together and make something. Mm -hmm. It just so happened, I think like six months after that, I was in Europe. And I was like, well, hey, I'm going to be in Europe flying over you. Could I stop in for a quick visit? And we hung out. Yep. Parachute worked. He was able to drop right out of the plane. And we made this cavalry saber. Don't run with swords! We made this cavalry saber. Cavalry saber? Wait. Pirate's, pirate's cutlass. cutlass. And we made this pirate's cutlass. This is a very cool sword. A very cool sword. I see you tactfully covering up that chip in the blade. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Jacob wants to know, when are we getting another Alex versus Will? Alex Metal, he must mean? He must mean. My alter ego. Yep, Alex Metal. There's never gonna be one of those. Alex Metal likes to hide away deep in the recesses of my brain. <laughs> It uh, doesn't come out very often. But in all seriousness, I think we do need to do a lot more steel versus steel. Yes, we do. Because they're it's... good fun. They're, 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 they're tiring though. Mm -hmm. And Will always wins is the trouble because he's just a much better knife maker. Well, we need to do some ones that aren't straight knives. That would be good. Callan wants to know, how many hours a week do you play Buzz? <laughs> so, Callan is the one of the gentlemen who works in the office here and Bums is not what it sounds like. It is a soccer game that it Alex is. brought over. I brought it over. Um, we would play a game of soccer where you kick the ball to the other person, and then if they don't manage to get it to another person in one bounce on the ground or less, they then get a letter. It then goes up to B-U-M-S. If you get an S, you're out. And then the whole team then pelts a football at you while you're turned around against uh, against a wall. So we negate that part of it. We don't do the, the ball pelting part. <laughs> but we do play it at least once a day here at the workshop fun. as a team building exercise and it is it's so, so much fun. Riley wants to know, how do you choose the swords you decide to make? We go through a very, very rigorous selection process wherein uh, generally one of us is like, hey, let's make this. And the other one's like, yeah, okay. Well, there's, it goes it's <laughs> the things that we consider. We consider because the business is making videos, we consider, would people want to see this project? Mm -hmm. So we consider this. We then consider, is it in our realm of technical capability or can we learn the things to make this happen? Mm -hmm. We then consider, do we want to make it? Is it a mildly enjoyable project? Mm -hmm. And that's kind of how we choose. But usually it's like 8.01 in the morning. We're like, wow, what are we going to do? Oh, let's, uh, let's make a spy hand. Yep. <laughs> Campbell wants to know, tacos or burritos? I still don't understand what the difference is between a fajita, a taco, and a burrito. Right, that's it, I'm leaving. And another this. Okay, fajita is the way that you cook it, and it's the seasoning that's in it. It's the way that you cook it, it's generally now, done. Do I not understand this seasoning. because I'm British? Yes. Or because I'm stupid? British. Although those two are synonymous. Hey, pull that back. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would say burritos just for, simply because they generally taste very similar, but burritos have the ease of use. Is taco the crispy one? Taco can be the crispy one. You can have hard shell or soft shell. Well, tacos. whatever the hard shell one is, that's no good. You just make a mess. Andrew is wanting to know, has there ever been a project you lost interest in halfway through? Yes. I would say so. <laughs> yes, there have been projects like that. Especially when we just make enough mistakes that it just starts to become really frustrating and difficult. But, I mean, making the bike, I cannot tell you how thrilled I am that I made the bike. I cannot tell you how much enjoyment I got in many of the parts of making the bike, but I cannot also stress to you how unbelievably frustrating and difficult it was at certain times. And I think it's the same with a whole load of projects. Yeah, for me, all of the big projects that we've done in the last year, basically, I've been pretty frustrated with them by the time that we're finished because we do 
generally reach outside of our comfort zones and that means that we make so many mistakes. So for there's like enjoyment and then there's a point where it then just becomes frustrating and then you finish it and it's like, oh, it's enjoyment again. Exactly. But you know, when you're sitting there tying your 35th wire Turk's head knot for the hilt of the sword breaker, you're like, you know what, is this really worth it? <laughs> and then at the end it, it, it is, but uh, you got to plug on through. Obviously we wouldn't be able to make videos where we're like, yes, actually this is incredibly frustrating right now. I do not want to do this. That wouldn't be any fun. Mm -hmm. So we try and highlight the bits of it that are enjoyable. In other words, we lie. <laughs> <laughs> so folks, I think that's gonna wrap up this Q&A. If you have questions that you would like answered the next time we do this, and Will made a suggestion, maybe we do this quarterly. Um, I said then maybe we do it sometime early. Nickelly or dimely. Yes, so at some point we're gonna do another Q&A and we'd love to hear your questions down below in the comments. So leave your questions there and we're gonna use this as our reference for the next Q&A very soon. Be sure to hit a like if you enjoyed this. Subscribe if you're new. Not that you've got it this far, if you're new. But of course, we have a sponsor in this episode and we'd like to give them a big thank you. So here we go. Thanks for watching guys. Today's sponsor has been Skillshare, host of the world's largest selection of online courses, 25,000 plus of them. You can learn all sorts of great skills there to increase your value as an employee or also push your business to new heights. We recently launched a new t-shirt design, pretty cool to celebrate the launching of our anvils. And t-shirts and printed merchandise have been a really great way for our audience to engage more with the brand and bring some revenue in. And it's really exciting to have people being able to wear your own things which is why you should absolutely check out this course by Jeff Staple, which is the definitive guide to t-shirt design and manufacturing. If you've got a creative vision that you wanna share with the world, getting on the right track by watching this course is gonna help you out a lot. But there's no shortage to the things you can learn with Skillshare. Whether you wanna increase your photography skills or even learn some more 3D modeling skills, you can do it with Skillshare. And right now is especially the time to do it because you're gonna get two months of Skillshare Premium for free when you go to our link in the description down below. It's usually just 10 bucks a month. So jump on it while you can. Thank you Skillshare for sponsoring this. Thank you guys for watching. Hit the like button and subscribe if you have enjoyed this. Just a few days left on the Anvil pre-order. See you all very soon. Bye-bye. Oh! My ears are ringing. I'm not even joking.